I cannot get over that phrase that Jesus came to get messy. Like that, that, that phrase just, it drives everything that I do as a pastor is the fact that Jesus came to get messy. Like we should come to get messy. What you say and what you believe about God or what you believe about the Bible, let's just be honest. It really doesn't make a hill of beans. It doesn't make any difference if you're not willing to put it into practice every time you're given that opportunity. We can know everything about this book. And if we're not willing to use it when we're given the opportunity, it doesn't mean a thing. It means nothing. I've been reading. Hopefully you're reading with me through Luke as we're trying to get through the New Testament. And, and, and Luke keeps talking about over and over and over that this basket is a, or this light that we light. We don't put it under a basket. We, we put it out there to drive away the dark. We, we light up the world with it. And every time we're given an opportunity to get messy and we choose not to, we might as well just putting a basket over our light. And that's one of those things that just keeps ringing in my head over and over and over. But I swear, every time I begin to preach through different topics of, topics of Scripture, God's like, oh, let me see, knucklehead, if you are willing to do what I'm calling you to do. Like, you call the, the people in the church to do it all the time. Let me see if you're willing to. And so here's kind of been my life lately. I've been given the opportunity to put into practice all the things we've been preaching. It feels like every single week, like... People coming at me and getting angry with me because their life is falling apart and I'm not doing anything about it, but yet I didn't know anything, so I didn't know to do anything about it. And so I can either be like, well, suck it up, buttercup. You know, you, you, <laughs> how about this one? How many of y'all have ever said this? You just make the bed, you, you sleep in the bed you make, right? Like, that's, that's not what people need to hear. So that's not my message to them. I was like, okay, well, let me see if I can give you love. Let me see if I can give you grace. I've had the opportunity to speak love and truth and, and minister to people who have left our church because they didn't like our church or, or whatever and then their world starts to fall apart and they don't know what to do and I get to go and I get to minister to them and they look at me and go well why would you do that we're on the same team I don't care if you go to our church or not that's not the point I've had the opportunity to speak truth and love even when it hurt to do it even when it wasn't fun, even whenever I didn't want to do it, I even tried to pawn it off on somebody else to do it. And so it's like, how do you cover that in, in truth and in love like we saw last week in John chapter 8? And so why would I tell you all that? Better yet, why would I do all that? It's because that's what love, that action word that we looked at a couple weeks ago, that's what love looks like. When we talk about loving people and loving an action verb, that's what it looks like. Scripture calls us to love people, to put your preferences and your differences aside and extend grace and love while still offering truth to people. And so this morning, if you've got your Bible with you, and I, I tell you every week, I hope you bring it, turn to Colossians 4. Um, hey, John, can we get these house lights on? Because I know they're not going to be able to read that fine print <laughs> without it. But Colossians 4, if you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, uh, there's one in the seat in front of you. Uh, grab that one out on page 669 is where you'll find Colossians 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible of your own that belongs to you, then do me a favor. Take that one home. It's yours. You can have it. We want everybody to have a copy of God's Word. And so Colossians, as we look at Colossians 4 this week, I want to give you a little backstory since it's been a long time since I've taught through the book of Colossians. Let me give you this. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae while he was in prison. And so in chapters 1 and 2, Paul starts out by sending words of thanks to these Christ followers in the city of Colossae. Of Colossae. And so if you're new to the Bible and you're trying to figure out what all these weird names of different books of the Bible are, Colossians is simply a letter that Paul wrote to the church in the city of Colossae. And because you lived in Colossae, you were a Colossian. All right? So if he wrote it to us, it might be the Miamisburgians. I don't, I don't know what he would call that. Uh, but that's what that is. So when you see these different names of these books of the Bible, I want you to understand that. Paul did not establish the Colossian church. And as a matter of fact, Paul had never even visited the Colossian church. But he teaches one of the most powerful messages attributing to the divinity of Jesus, who is God in the flesh. And that's his whole purpose of writing this letter to them. False teachers were spreading this heresy by rejecting the fact that Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh. And so they were going around going, no, 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 that's not him. They were probably teaching something crazy like he was just like a unique guy. He was a unique man, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's the, the buttons on the bottom, those 
yep, those buttons there. There you go. Top ones, that top row, I think it is. There. Ooh, here we go. We got light. I'm going to fire Ben for not ever showing you that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ben, he probably did once. All right, we're good. I think, can y'all see now? A little better? All right, perfect. And so you have these false teachers, and the heresy that they're teaching is that Jesus was like this unique guy. He was, he was, nobody denies the fact that he lived. It's just, who was he? And so Paul is warning them not to let anybody lead you astray by their philosophy, their trickery, or, or their different traditions, all these different things. That's the point of what he's writing. Then in chapter 3, he encourages the church to focus on God. He, he uses these words. In, in verse 2, chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. So he's saying, hey, get your mind right. As you're getting ready to go into this battle, as people are trying to teach you all these things, get your mind right. And so he begins in chapter 3 to teach them how to follow Christ at home, how to manage their family matters, how to get along with others who are also following Christ. And his approach for followers of Christ is to put aside these petty situations that are becoming obstacles of day-to-day living and they're becoming obstacles of how to get the gospel to go further faster and he says just just stop doing all that so here in chapter four where we come up to paul gives us a few principles on how to have real missional living and so if we're going to be real we got to understand what does it look like to live my life as a missionary every single day not just when i get sent on a mission trip and so i want to look at verses two through six this morning as he talks about speaking to God and speaking to others. And so here's what he says. Colossians chapter four, starting in verse two, Paul writes this. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for us For the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. In other words, as you pray, remember what I challenged you on last week? Pray for God to give you opportunities. That's literally what Paul is calling them on right now. He's saying, pray that God would give me opportunities every time the door is open that I may walk through it. Even though I'm in chains, the the message I'm in chains for, that I would have the courage to go share that. Verse 4, he says, so that I may make it known as I should. Verse 5. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. See, I find these verses incredible because even though Paul is in prison, he's giving some instructions on missional living, how to live your life as a missionary. And I I think we can find very simply three things. If you don't have three things in a message, it's not a sermon, okay? It's just a fancy talk, all right? So here's the three things I think we can pick out of this. Number one, pray daily for opportunities. Here's where I struggle with telling you that. I shouldn't have to tell you that. As followers of Jesus, this should not be something the pastor should have to stand in the pulpit and teach about. Pray daily for opportunities. But if I'm honest, that, that's, that's the culture we live in. We, we don't do this. We'll pray for broken toenails, and we'll pray for a broken knee. We'll pray for all kinds of things. But rarely do we approach the throne of God and pray for opportunities. And if I'm honest right here, if I'm writing this and I'm locked up in prison, my prayer is going to be pretty simple. Just get me out of here. I'm probably not praying the way Paul did. But, but Paul's prayer life is not limited by temporal. It's focused on the eternal. And that's a great way to gauge our prayer life. Are we focusing on all the little things that are temporal around us? Or are we asking God to pray for big things that are eternal? Paul was the greatest missionary to ever walk the planet. And so he had this deep commitment to prayer. He had this deep commitment to the first part of my life, I missed it. Yes, when I found out about Jesus, I thought he was one of these false teachers until he made himself known to me as I was traveling. And now he says, I- I'm going to be devoted to this. Look at how he was devoted to prayer. Look at verses two and three. He calls them, Devote yourselves to prayer, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. In other words, don't just start praying and mumbling that you don't even know what you're talking about. Stay alert. Know what you're saying. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Is that not incredible? He's in jail as an innocent man, and here he is writing this letter to say, hey, keep going. 
Keep going. Look at, don't, don't worry about circumstances. Don't worry about what I'm doing. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. You keep going. Pray for God to give me opportunities, and you pray for opportunities for yourself. One of the things about the Journey Community Church is we're serious about missions. We're serious about how we're going to support missionaries. We're serious about how we're going to send out people on mission trips. We're serious about bringing mission trips here, mission teams. They can come here and give them a place to serve, all these different things. When we talk about here, near, and far, that's a strategy that we're serious about. Why? Because Jesus' last command to us was the Great Commission to go and make disciples. He didn't say stay. He didn't say just, just huddle up in your churches and sit in the pew and, and read the Bible and, and smile and eat great donuts and all these things. By the way, those donuts are great, are they not? Bear Creek donuts are probably some of the best. But he says, no, 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 I want you to go and make disciples. Acts 1.8, he makes it really clear. Luke tells us where we should go, to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria. And in our brains today, I'm not a geography guy. Like, that's just one of those things that I just don't get. I don't understand where everything sits in the world. So how can we make Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria easy for us? Here, near, and far. That, that, that's where we get that. It's from Acts 1.8. He wants us to go here, near, and far. But when you go, whether you're here or you're near or you're far, you're on a mission trip, you get this missional mindset, right? You, you begin every day, hopefully, in the Word because you're like, well, I'm on a mission trip. This is what I should be doing. And so it seems like we tend to get into God's Word when we go on mission trips. And we wake up every day with, with the task on hand. Yes, I have a job to do, but the more important thing I should be doing is sharing the gospel. One of the things I love about the mission trips that we do near up in Cleveland is we go do construction on houses. And Mike, our, our missions director, he, he tells us every single time, he says, hey, the goal is not to complete the project. If we don't finish the project, that's okay. Somebody's going to come and here in the city. We've already got partners. They're going to come finish it for us. The goal is to make Christ known to those that were around. So if you're working on this house and somebody comes walking down the street or they walk up to you and they go, what are you guys doing here? Stop working and go have that opportunity to tell them what you're doing here, to talk to them. That, that's what it looks like. We should be living every single day like that. We should be living every single day for looking for opportunities to share Christ with people. What if I told you that God of the universe wants us to live in such a way that we're on a mission trip every single day? Have you ever thought about that? Has anybody ever told you that? Some of these signs can be corny, but I think they deliver a great message. I've seen signs as I'm pulling out of church parking lots that says, you are now entering the mission field. The first time I ever saw one of those signs, I thought, man, I never really thought about it that way. We are. This is not the mission field. This is where we come to get trained and get sent out from. The mission field is outside of here. It's not just a trip. It's a lifestyle. That's exactly what we should be praying for. But the greatest detriment, in my opinion, to effective missional living is a non-missional mindset. It's not praying for those opportunities, praying for the different opportunities. So, so how do we do that? Well, just like Paul says here in verse 3, pray that I may have the opportunities, that God may open the door for us, to, for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Is it wrong to pray for sick people to get well? Absolutely not. That's intercessory prayer. Is it wrong to pray for the things that you need? No, that's petition. But, but please, when you pray, make sure you don't stop with just the temporal stuff. Make sure some of your prayer time is praying for God to give you the opportunity to advance the gospel further and faster. Because if kingdom motives never make it into your prayer life, there's no chance of them making it into your heart. And if they're not in your heart, they're never going to show up in your hands and your feet. So it all starts with prayer. When the Bible talks about praying without ceasing, it's this idea of this continual prayer life. It's this God consciousness that we walk around with. It's the idea of having God in front of your mind so that no matter what happens, you instantly stop and you either thank God for the great things or you go to God for the things of need. That's what it looks like to pray without ceasing. You see a bad thing, you run to God on behalf of it. That's what it looks like. But this, ver this, this phrase in verse 2 says, stay alert in it. In the Greek, it means to be courageous and bold and persistent. To be focused on it. 
If you're going to pray big prayers, be bold enough to do something about it. People who are consistently living on mission and praying through those are people who are consistently and courageously and boldly praying for God to give them the opportunity to take the gospel further and faster. That's what it should look like. Our prayer team just had a meeting last Sunday right here in this room of ways that they can come together and pray more fervently, pray that God would do more things rather than just an email. How can we get together and pray? And I love the email that I saw that came out of that, kind of the recap of that, of all the ways the prayer team is going to be moving forward to pray. I love it. Tonight, Pastor Ben is leading a prayer and worship gathering, a whole worship gathering of nothing but worship and prayer. No messages. I'm not even going to speak. It's all on prayer and all about worship. That's what it's about. We're serious about prayer because we should be. We all should be. And so if you want to experience real missional living, pray consistently as Paul did that doors would be open for the gospel. The second thing I find here in this text, I think it's pretty simple. It's one of my favorites. We should be smart in how we live. Be smart in how you live. Can I translate that for you? Don't do dumb things, right? Like that, that's pretty simple, right? Maybe write that one down instead. Don't do dumb things. The, the reason that the gospel oftentimes doesn't gain an audience is because we failed to realize how important our nonverbal witness is. Now, if you don't know this about me, I have a, a, a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Like I thought I was going to serve my whole career as a police officer. That was where I was going with it. And so I won't go into that whole story today, but one of the things that I studied was body language. My kids hate me for it because I can read their body language. I know exactly what they're doing. I can read your body language. That's one of the things, I, that's why I love to people watch because I, I'm really reading body language of people. It's this little habit that I have. I know when they're lying. I know what their eyes do. I studied all this. And so I won't ever tell my kids what their eyes do when they lie, but I can just look you in the eye and I know if you're lying to me. It's what you get for having me as your pastor, but that's what it looks like. How important is our nonverbal witness to people? The things that we do, not necessarily what we say. See, whether we like it or not, we live in this skeptical culture that saturated the mindset that truth is relative, it's not objective. And our actions are crucial in giving credibility to our message. Have you ever heard that old cliche, your actions are speaking so loud I can't hear what you're saying? Actions speak louder than words kind of a deal. Look at verse 5. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Act wisely. What, what is wisdom? Well, it's properly evaluating circumstances and making godly decisions so that you can represent Christ better to those who don't know him. Just think about the Colossians here that Paul's writing this to. How, how did they advertise their faith? Well, first, they were a minority, right? I mean, they were a little tiny minority. They had no church building. They had no big cross. They didn't even know about the cross yet. Well, I guess they did back then. Yes, Jesus had already died on the cross. My bad. Back up. I'm still in Luke, man. My brain has been reading Luke for weeks, and so I'm still stuck over here in Luke. They had a cross. They had no billboards. They had no radio. They had, they had no way to display all the things. They didn't have a little <laughs> church sign that says, God answers an email. Like, come on. Like, let's just stop doing that, all right? If we ever put a church sign out here that has messages on it and we ever put anything like that, you may fire me instantly, okay? Like, you're like, oh, the people driving by, they laugh at that, they like it. No, they're laughing at us. They're not laughing with us, all right? So we got to stop being weird. Don't do dumb things. That's the whole point of this, right? You want to know how they got the message out? They got the message in and they lived it. That was and that is still the only credible way to evangelize to the world. It's our nonverbal stuff. It's the way we act. It's the things that we do. Live out what you preach. So in verse 5, he says, act wisely towards outsiders. He's talking about those people who do not follow Christ, those people who don't think like you. Christ followers are on the inside. We should be taking the gospel and acting wisely towards those who are on the outside. And then he says, making most of the time. Now, this is what I want to I want to point this out. The Greek word here for time is not chronos, like we think about our watch time. It's kairos, which is opportunities. It should translate, making the most of every opportunity. If we were to read it like that, 
we would read it and say, act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Do we do that? Like, let's just, let's just ask that honest question. Don't blow an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody because what you're saying is contradicting the way you live. That, that, that's the biggest way to shut people's ears off immediately. Hold on, time out. You're telling me blah, 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 but your lifestyle is brrrr. It just doesn't line up. The two have got to line up or they're never going to listen to us. I, I, <laughs> I could pull out a list of things that we, those of us in this room, collectively do that makes people outside of the walls, just outside the walls of this building, just shake their head in disbelief. You know why? Because we don't think about it. We don't think about the two things going hand in hand and we go, well, I can, I can believe this and say all this and yeah, I may just screw up from time to time and do this. But when that becomes just our lifestyle, at some point we got to go back to what Jesus talked about with those knuckleheads in Luke and he just said, I, I came so that you wouldn't stay this way. I came so that you would change and be like me. And so most non-Christians automatically assume that most Christians are hypocrites. But reinforcing this idea of not doing dumb things, acting wisely towards others, is the opposite. It's redeeming the opportunities. Here's, here's number three. I think it goes along with number two. Like, Paul had a theme going on here. That's why I really can't wait to meet Paul in heaven. I think he and I might have the same sense of humor. But in verse six, I, I, I see where he's talking about be smart when talking to non-Christians. Be smart. Don't do dumb things. And don't say dumb things, Right? That's really what Paul, that's his political way of saying, don't be stupid. Don't do dumb things. Don't say dumb things. Consistency of life is followed by consistency of speech. If you're going to talk the talk, then you've got to walk the walk. Look down at verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Now, he's not talking about preaching the gospel. I think we can all pretty much agree to that. He's talking about general conversations we have. Let your, let your speech be seasoned with salt. How many of you are my salt lovers in the room? I am. Yeah, Chase, your hand goes up first. You're probably the youngest guy in the room, and his hand's up first, right? How many of you guys, your food comes out, and you don't even taste You just grab the salt. Yep, that's right. I was, in a, I was at a job interview, believe it or not, at the church where I was your youth pastor, and we went out to dinner while I was interviewing for this position back in 2006, and the pastor literally said, I can judge a lot about somebody when the food comes. If they salt and pepper their food too early, they make decisions without knowing all the information. I'm like, no, I just like my salt and my pepper, right? I don't care what it tastes like. I want more. Have you ever had mashed potatoes with no salt on them? Yeah, exactly. Don't listen. If you've never eaten mashed potatoes with no salt, just don't do it. All right. I'm too much of a foodie to tell you to try it because it's going to ruin your taste buds. Don't even try it. It's terrible. And that's exactly Paul's point here in verse six. He's saying, let your speech be seasoned with salt. Let it be gracious. When you talk to people, don't let it be like unsalted mashed potatoes where they walk away from you going, what in the world did I just experience? What was that? When we do this, it's extending this horizontal grace. It's giving people, whether you're, you're being persecuted or stressful, you're, whatever's going on, whether it's with your wife or your kids or whoever, when, you, when your words are seasoned with salt to other people around you, it's this horizontal grace. And I've got to say this, even though it may not be popular, but I'm going to address it as a pastor over the last few years, I'm going to be honest with you, I have been mortified at some of the things I've seen on social media by professing Christians and members of churches that I've been on staff at. I've just been more like, did, did you really just put, did you, did, you, did you really just write that? Like, no joke, one time I saw this one statement, it's been a few years ago, by a, a lady who was a member of the church that I had served at in the past, and it was the most vulgar, cursing message, you ready? And it was it was about something that somebody else had posted that offended her. Does anybody else, like, like Ben sees it. Ben sees the irony there. This, this vulgar message, which is she was offended about something somebody else posted. I'm like, do you, not, do you not see what you just did? Like, are we not wise enough to figure this out? 
And some of you are like, legalism, he's a legalist, and you know I'm not, right? But there, there's just times where our, our, our words need to be seasoned with salt. It's not about legalism. It's about holiness. It's about taking serious what the Bible says. Legalism is adding to God's word. It's taking God's commandments and adding things in there that just aren't there. I can pull out a list if you'd like, but I don't think we have time for all that today. So let's not be legalists. Let's not be like the Pharisees. Let's not add things that are our personal preference to God's word. Let's live a life of holiness where we take the things that are written here and we take it serious. That's what holiness is. Don't add to it. Just be serious about what it says. So when Paul says, let your conversation be gracious, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that's a personal holiness issue. How do you talk to people? How do you witness to people? Are you abrasive? Do you shove it down their throats? How do you deal with conflict? Are you mad? Do you get angry? Do you fly off the handle? Like, what does it look like? Look at verse 6. It's, it's very clear. It's black ink on white paper. Like, I've been in full-time ministry for 22 years, and I still can't figure out the gap between vertical grace and horizontal grace. And what I mean by that is we talk about vertical grace all the time. We want God to give us all this grace because I'm an idiot. I'm a knucklehead. I do all these things where I screw up. I don't always say the right thing. God, just give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace. And then we're like that parable that Jesus teaches. And the minute it's our turn to extend some horizontal grace, no, no, no. You offended me. You, you made me angry. You're getting my wrath. And my favorite statement of all is it's just, it's just the way God made me. That is a lie. God did not make you that way. That is something we learn, and that's something we've never dealt with, and I don't have time to go into that today either. Well, I'm getting a lot of sermons today, all right? But I, I, I just don't understand how we sometimes profess that the Spirit of God dwells in us, yet we're hateful and critical, and we keep score to those around us. Like grace has filled our hearts, but somehow poison spews out from our mouths. So, so what do we do with this? Three simple principles that he gives us here. Pray for people. Don't act stupid and don't say stupid things. Like, how, how do we take these things and how do we be real with people? And let me explain it this way. When we talk about real missional living, missions is not about writing a check, getting on a bus and, and going somewhere, hopping on an airplane or whatever, doing good Missions is living every day with a mind that is saturated with God-centered, gospel-driven thoughts and prayers. That's what it means to live missionally. Missions is redeeming the opportunities around you by living a way that gives credibility to the Christ that you proclaim to follow. That's what missional living looks like. Missions is, is speaking, posting, texting in a manner that's consistently marked by grace-filled words, seasoned with salt, because you can't preach Jesus out of one side of your mouth and tear people down out of the other side of your mouth. It just doesn't work that way. And so what do we do about it? Well, let me give you two things. Number one, if you're here, and you're not a follower of Christ, then maybe step one for you is you make a commitment to begin to follow Christ. You make a commitment to surrender your life to King Jesus. But can I just be honest with you? That doesn't mean your life gets easy. It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. It doesn't. That had been really cool, right? But it doesn't work that way. I tell people all the time, if you surrender your life to Jesus, now listen to me, if you surrender your life to Jesus, chances are your life might actually get harder. Because Satan goes, I lost him, I'll just make him miserable. That, that, that's just the truth. I'm not going to be a pastor who talks you into something that's not true. And so the question is, are you willing to trust that God will take care of all the other stuff that Satan tries to bring your way if you're faithful to him and you surrender your life to Jesus and you live in such a way that mirrors him, are you willing to trust the fact that God will take care of the rest of it? That begins the journey of becoming a missionary. That begins the journey of missional living. And maybe you're here and you're already a follower of Christ. 
then your next step is to take to heart these, these three steps from Colossians 4, but also by taking action. Think about the things we've talked about over the last three weeks. Becoming a, a better neighbor. We talked about that three weeks ago from Acts chapter 2 and 3. Overstepping the boundaries of socialness. People who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, who don't act like you, who don't vote like you, and going after them for the gospel, like Pastor Michael talked about from John chapter 5. Making a real difference to hurting people like we talked about last week from John chapter 8 about this adulterous woman who Jesus had every right to condemn her, and he didn't. He gave her truth and he gave her love. Does your life follow those things? And then today, becoming a missionary. Living your life in such a way where you're focused on the people around you and living in a missional mindset every single day. So here's, I think, probably the hardest question. What do you need to do? Do you need to surrender your life to Christ today? Is that something that, that God's been kind of tugging at you? Do you need to be a better neighbor? Do you need to love on people better than what you've been doing? Do you, do you need to, to be better about crossing those social boundaries and, and, and sharing the gospel and just, just loving on people, everybody? Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter what they look like. And that's followed up by just showing truth and love to people who are hard to love, people who've made a mess of their life. I want to pray, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what it is he's calling you to do. So let's just pray right now. I'm a firm believer that when the gospel is preached, when God's word is taught, the Holy Spirit is the one who calls us to action. I never want to be a group of people who hear God's word and we just walk out of here going, that was a great message, but we never do anything about it. So I'm asking you right now, in this posture of prayer, would you be bold enough to say, Holy Spirit, change my heart right now? Would you be willing to ask the Holy Spirit, what is it you're asking me to change? Something I've learned that's really cool in my spiritual life is usually that very first thing that pops in my head. <laughs> that's it. At least that's the biggest one. What is it that the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart right now? Do you have the courage to surrender that to him right now? If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, are you willing to do that right now? If you are, would you just have this conversation with God? Would you say, God, I don't have all the answers. You, you know what I'm going through. You know what I'm dealing with. You know why I've never surrendered. But today, Lord, I am surrendering to you. Today, I am releasing myself to you. King Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to cover my sins with your blood. I accept that sacrifice right now. Would you forgive me for all my sins, my past, my present, the future? And would you give me the courage to live my life in a way that honors you every single day? I know I'm not perfect. I know I'll never be perfect. But I surrender to you today. Holy Spirit, change me. And then very importantly, I want you to say this to the Lord. Thank you. Number one, I think we don't do that enough. But number two, I think we forget the fact, or maybe we just don't know, that if you had that sincere conversation, if you were sincere and you just had that conversation between you and God, then you are saved. You're now a Christian. He, he keeps his promises. 
You are now a follower of Jesus Christ, saved, a place in heaven marked for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 makes it very clear that when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we are a brand new creation in Christ. The old is dead, it's passed away, and we are brand new. You are not the same person you were when you sat down in that seat. Praise God for that. Show him some gratitude for that. For those of you who are saved, who have been praying for the Holy Spirit to change you, to do something different in you, ask him to give you the courage to live that out. Not just some emotional experience on a Sunday morning sitting in church, but the courage to live that out tomorrow and the next day and next week and next month and next year, all the days that you remain on this earth. Lord, thank you for moving in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for as simple as it is, we can understand your truth. Help us to change. Help us to be serious about every day living in such a way that we look for opportunities to talk about you. Let our desire be to create a culture around us where we help make heaven full and hell empty. That's my desire. And so Lord, as we shift our focus right now and we give back to you with our tithes and our offerings, God bless us as we give. Receive what we, we give to you and, and multiply it to reach more people here, near and far. And bless those, God, who so generously give. Bless those who generously support the mission of the Journey Community Church to go take the gospel further, faster. We give this done to you, Lord, and ask for you to, to move through it. And I pray all that in the name of Jesus. Amen.